Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Uh, huh, like it's the first uh, <laughs> live Q&A uh, for uh, this winter. So now this week we're going to be doing uh, every week uh, one episode <clears throat> on the Wednesday, like usually. So we did last week how to set up your bindings because it's uh, probably a good thing to start uh, while... Uh, you know, like at the beginning of the season when you're getting your gear ready and especially like depending on when you are, if you can't be riding. Uh, and then every following Wednesday, we're going to be uh, like doing some live Q&As so that we can talk about anything like on the subject that we posted the week before or um, on anything else. So, um, so yeah, like uh, wayward <laughs> roots. Hello. <laughs> and Servus Wolf. Yeah, nice. Uh, it's nice to see you guys uh, showing up. Salut, Basil. <laughs> so I, I will do like uh, once in English and then uh, like the, the, the following times I'll go, um, I'll go in French. So it, there's going to be a bit of uh, both because, uh, yeah, I get, uh, <laughs> I get told off quite often to, to not do in, uh, in French. So, so that's good. So guys, yeah, I see you. Like slowly, you guys are coming in. Hello, morning from Canada. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I'm in Switzerland now. There's snow outside. You can see outside the window. Woo! So it's uh, like winter is uh, starting to come, and the resort is open. And tomorrow, I'm gonna get uh, probably a bit of a, a bit of a session. Yeah. It's good. Still very rocky outside here. It hasn't snowed as much as in other parts of uh, Europe, but it's uh, winter is here finally. So it's good after all this sunshine. So guys, uh, yeah. So I've got a, a first quest question from uh, Wade Ward. How do you feel about touring with snowshoes? Well, I think it is. Uh, it kind of works, but uh, but it's very limited and. If you start split boarding, you will quickly realize that uh, snowshoes are, are uh, yeah, they are right, but they're not for long distances and they take a lot of space in your backpack and they're heavy. Whereas with a split board, like everything is under your feet and when you're going to be riding, you've got nothing on your back. So it makes a big difference in the fact of gliding as well. Uh, you have a lot more uh, flotation on snow, so it's, uh, it's a much better thing. And uh, yeah, snowshoes can be a good thing uh, in like in big deep pow, which is kind of wet, uh, wet pow, kind of Alaska or or Canadian pow like, and um, and basically, oh wait, sorry, I'm listening to myself up, and uh, yeah, like in very steep terrain with heavy pow, like they're called uh, verts. So they're kind of snowshoes that are stuck to your feet so they don't have the leverage. And they're really, really good to, to climb really steep, deep, deep powder, but on a fairly dense powder. So if you have the chance, like Canadians or Alaskans or people that have gone there might have tried them, they're great. Um, yeah, I've got a question on uh, thoughts on hard boots setups for split boarding. And uh, yeah, actually... Like hard boot setup definitely works better than a soft boot setup uh, for uphill because you've got the stiffness sideways, which allows you to go a bit like a skier to not have any movement sideways, which means that, uh, that you keep your grip. Like even if your board is wider than skis, you still have a much better grip uh, sideways when, when the snow is, is, uh, is hard. So it's a very good system. And, uh, and basically... Uh, it, it's good, but for the way down, it's uh, it, it, it's not that great. So, like, I think something in between would be the dream, uh, like, because the comfort of the soft boot is like unbeatable, and it's a reason why we all snowboard, and especially also that freedom when you ride, you need everything to be soft. But then on the uphill, uh, of course, like, yeah, it doesn't work perfectly all the time because of that side, uh. Uh, like setup, but I am like I've been, it's been a few years. I've, I'm trying to think of a system that would be in between. I'm trying to work on it, and uh, and hopefully, 
uh, fairly soon we can come up with something that works because there is something to be done for sure. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't keep up. <laughs> Too many questions. Um, oh, yes, someone is asking me about uh, Paramoto snowboarding. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one because uh yeah that's something really really cool that i yeah it's been what a few years that i've done degrees north so to drop with a with a well basically it can be used as a single paramotor it can be used to access uh, to get closer to a line or to scope but then with a tandem you can jump into the line and that's really amazing but uh, only works in fairly lowish altitudes, so until 2,000 meters, 6,000 feet. And then after that, it's going to be really tough to, to get much higher in winter. Uh, and also, you're uh, dependent on uh, aerology, like on, on winds and things in the mountains, which can be tricky, uh, because especially that you're flying really close to ridges, so you can get uh, closure, so you're on, uh, on technical terrain uh, in terms of flying. So... So it works, but it doesn't work like every day. But, uh, but when it works, it's amazing. And, and I definitely need to do another trip with that. Um, how can you improve your, uh, your split boarding? I am a beginner in split boarding. And, and what do you suggest me to improve? Um, I think already the first thing uh, to improve split boarding is to really get a good grip on your gear, which means like using your gear a lot which means you know exactly how to make it tight, how to not get it stuck, how when it's full of snow at the top of your line, you know, how to undo the bindings, you know, uh, you, know you get confident about your, your, your gear. And that is a really good thing. And also, you know that you're used to being having all your gear in your backpack when you get out. Uh, because for sure, the first days of the season, when you go split boarding, you're like, oh, I forgot this, I forgot that, I didn't do this. And then slowly, you, you get tuned a little better and better. And that makes a massive difference. Uh, and already, once you have that, that dialed in, then it's just the technique. And then the, the basic technique of split boarding, you will, you will get it slowly. Like You can watch a few uh, tutorials. So one of my how-to... Uh, I'm going to have one that's quite specific about... Uh, um like yeah about touring and, and then you're gonna see a bit more like details on what you could work on but uh yeah basically you just need to get out there get the few things work on it and then you'll quickly feel what works better and what doesn't all right uh a question from olivier uh which is better crampons uh under shoes or crampons under the board um hmm. That's a good question, and I would say that uh, uh, it depends, basically. Crampons under the, the board, it doesn't really uh, change much, and it makes a big, big difference. You know, you don't lose much effect. Like, you, you, you know, it's not hard to drag or anything, but then you get a good grip, and I think that's a really good midway uh, option. And then crampons... Under the feet, it's only when it's really steep, and, and and it would not work even with skis. You know what I mean? So, uh, so I think it's good to always have the crampons, uh, like for the board, and, and then the crampons under the shoes as well. I'm trying to read the questions as well. It, it makes me a bit crazy. Ski or snowboard? Hey, Amen. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I used to ski when I was a kid. So, like, skiing is fun, but snowboarding is powder. Uh, in powder is unbeatable. I'm sorry. I have a lot of respect for skiers. You have a like a lot more mobility in the mountains. That's for sure. So we we uh, like for us it's a bit harder. But man, when riding, uh, for me there's a uh, no 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 question. Snowboarding, <laughs> like the feeling of snowboarding is magical. And uh, I think Telemark has a bit of the, the compromise, I would say, because uh, you have the freedom of moving and things, you know, that which you have in snowboarding. Uh, and, and you also have your skis to move around, which is easier, but hey, man, snowboarding. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping a lot of questions. So if you have, if I've missed your question, feel free to uh, like to bring, uh, like, yeah, to write it again on or if not, yeah, come again next time and, and, and I'll, I'll answer. Um, so, like, someone, yeah, like, Felix is asking how to 
uh, had to give us a spot on camping, like, uh, like had to pick up a spot on camping, like legal restrictions in Europe. What is your key item that makes your camping day? Uh, all the best from Germany. <laughs> no, camping, yeah, camping is great because first of all, it's fun. Like it's a great time. It's a great way, you know, to be in the mountains on your own experience, really the mountain in a different way, you know, feeling really close to the elements. And as well, it gives you the chance to being really early and to have the time to see the mountain evolve, see your line evolve uh, and be at the top when you need. So I think it's something that I really recommend. And camping on snow might feel like crazy, but if you have the right gear, if you have the good backpacks and everything, then, uh, then I would say that uh, it, it's super comfortable. Uh, and like even the people that are scared to be cold and stuff, just get the good gear and you're going to have a magical uh, time. I think it's actually almost better than camping in summer because you have no insects, no dust, no nothing. It's just snow. It's cold. But yeah, uh, you're warm in your sleeping bag, in your puffer, make your water uh, as much as you want, uh, and that makes it easy. Yeah. Um, so question from a uh, what stove uh, cooking system uh, do you use uh, I, I use a jet boil usually because yeah I, I never go like I've, like wherever I go it's like it will be maximum minus 20 Celsius and jet boil works really great it's a bit insulated it's fast it's quite compact and I think that's a great system yeah um, Ta -ta 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 -ta. What kind of skins do you recommend and why? Uh, so many stuff of brand and attached it. Uh, I'm getting my bindings with plume. Great, great system, same as mine. Uh, I think skins, what's important is to have the skins attached to the back. And then uh, you can have glueless or with glue. I think with glue, they will be more durable in time. And they're going to be also you know, like probably uh, sticking better in every kind of conditions, but they're going to be heavier. And, and you can have the glueless, which are great, super compact, super minimal. But as soon as it gets really cold, and if you do several days in a row and your skins cannot really dry because it's cold and everything, then, um, then, then I'd say buff, buff. Yeah. A question from Artish. Is it worth uh, to buy split board boots? Mm. I, I think for me, like, so with Deluxe, we, we've been uh, making like some options to open the back of your boot uh, to allow your split boarding. And, uh, and like right now, I feel that, you know, having opening in the back of your boot is good for split boarding, but you lose a lot uh, snowboarding on, on the riding part. And I think you lose more than what you gain on the uphill. So I would not recommend to get split board uh, boots for touring. But I would recommend like mountaineering kind of boots. So that are a bit more rugged, uh, that have good soles, uh, that are solid, that are well insulated, that have crampon holds, and, uh, and basically that are still soft and still rideable in a nice way. So I think that's my personal opinion. Some people like more hardcore, more technical touring or mountaineering uh, boots. But I think mine, like the Deluxe XV, is like quite versatile and I think that's a good compromise and, and especially the priority is for me is the writing. Yeah. Um, question from Geoffrey, quelle est la meilleure manière? Uh, what's the best way to start to ride uh, like steep skiing? Uh, well, uh, like that's a good question. Steep skiing, it's a bit like mountaineering. So, so like you need to be familiar with the, the basics of a uh, steep skiing, which means like being able to use a bit of a rope, uh, how to make an anchor, how to rappel a bit, how to secure yourself if you get in a situation where you don't. You need to have all the gear. So in, in steep, you need to be able at any time to climb back up if you need to, because you might uh, end up being in, in, a, in a kind of terrain or situation or conditions that are a no-go and where you need to go back up. So I think that's the priority. You need to take a lot of time. You need to go with someone else and, and like potentially take it step by step like always in the mountains. So never feel uh, you're too strong. And if you have a doubt, uh, always turn back. That's the, I think the hardest thing to do in free riding is to turn back. Um, tac, tac. 
what rope do you use when you go snowball mountaineering? Uh, it depends uh, what rope. It will depend if I go just touring on a glacier or if I'm going to be really climbing uh, some really technical uh, terrain uh, with rock climbing a bit in it. Uh, but usually I have... Um, I have a petzl rope, uh, like which comes in the shit. What's the name of it? Like the the um, uh, well, it, it's basically a five or six mil. Um, ah, shit. What's the name? I'm stupid. Uh, sorry. Like it comes. It's basically it comes in a little bag. Uh, it's super compact. It's thirty meters, and I think that that's kind of really a great versatile uh, thing to have. But you can't do really big rappels. So if you need to do big rappels, you, know, you take a bigger one. That's the thing. And if you like, if you're gonna climb really technical stuff where you might fall, uh, like in, in a in a climbing way, then you need a, a bit of a thicker one. Yeah. So so maybe eight mils or something. Yeah. But that's like kind of more mountaineering questions, which like so you can find the the, the answers with that. Um, uh, oh yeah, how much uh, how much did becoming a father uh, impact your risk of taking decisions? Uh, that's a good question because yeah, I got a f I got father again uh, uh, last year, so my second daughter is a year and a half, and, and it's true that um, it's something that's in your head, uh, and that's uh, that that makes it uh, really, but yeah, it makes you think twice. But uh, I've always felt that I was uh, like fairly careful and. Uh, like even in my craziest years, uh, I think I was like always taking the risk on the on the right time, but um, but still taking the risk, and and for sure, yeah, like being a father like makes you think once more, but at the same time, if you do things right, you can still do things that are fairly exposed. You know, as long as you, I believe really in the fact of not doing it every day. Like if you do it every day, every day, all the time, you push it, you push it, then your odds of uh, having a big problem, they just come up a lot. And I think that if you choose your days in a smart way, I think uh, that makes a difference and you can do amazing things and still come back home, like embrace your daughters or your, your sons and, um, and, and feel good about it. Yeah. A uh, question from uh, Basil again uh like in french ski resort that are closed <laughs> there's going to be a lot of split borders uh do you think that there's going to be a specific risk to uh non-groomed resorts yeah i think that's a good question because that's going to be something where this year a lot of people are going to be split boarding and yeah when you split board on your own that this that the resort is not open it's really much harder to get snow assessment to see what's being ridden to see what's gone down you have less time to just go and do a few runs feel the snow and then go on something heavier so it, it, it's basically the real deal like when you're free ride in a ski resort it's um in a way, it's great because uh, in a way it's safer, but at the same time, it's not the real mountains where you have the real risk where snow hasn't been touched, hasn't been ridden, and where you know the the consequences change quite a lot, like the effect on um of your riding on the snow. So I think it will be even more important, uh, you know, when you go outside the resort to to read the snow and to be careful in your choices. And uh, to not go on your own and to follow all the procedures in in a even stronger way, yeah. Uh, oh, the rat system, Keith. Thank you. I'm so stupid. <laughs> I had a beer. That's why I'm like my brain is not working. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Petzl rat. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like so, what are the tricks for keeping your boots liners dry in the back country? Um, I think what, uh, my trick to do it is to slip with them. So basically, you do your day, and then at night uh, you do whatever. And when you go to sleep, you put on your your liners. You keep them on your feet, or maybe you take them off, but they will dry less. But if you keep them on your feet and you sleep with them at the bottom of your sleeping bag, they're gonna dry really well. So yeah, in case you have a <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, in case you want to do this, I think that's a good option. 
And then otherwise, if you're not sleeping in a tent, normally you're always able to, to get them to dry. So, so that's not a problem. But, uh, but try that. It feels a bit crazy, but, uh, but it, it really works. Yeah. Um, tac, tac, tac. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, it means that I'm ugly. Thanks, man. <laughs> da, da, da. Sorry. Uh, what is accepts uh, like a question from Yuri? How do you decide what is acceptable acceptable risk for going off piste? In our resort, when it snows, the avalanche risk is usually level three, and we have mostly between thirty and forty degrees slope. Um, I think well, that's a good question because basically, uh, you cannot judge an acceptable risk on the level or the, the angle of the slope because uh, that's only two parameters, and there are so many more parameters which may dis like make you decide if you ride your line or not. Uh, avalanche like avalanche level three is very common. Uh, avalanche four, you need to start to be very careful. And avalanche five, normally you don't you don't even play. Like you you kind of go go to the bar. <laughs> but um, but yeah, on 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 level three with thirty to forty degrees, like you, it's not happy days. Like you cannot just go out there and. Uh, and think, okay, it's only level three, 30 degrees angles, like whatever, because 30 degrees angles is is basically the, the worst angle for avalanche uh, danger. So that's one thing to consider. But I think you, you, you shouldn't think like this. This gives you an indication, and then you go out there, so you see that uh, things are doable, but it's not guaranteed, uh, and you're gonna be always riding thinking that uh, there's going to be an avalanche. So you always imagine the worst case scenario. I think to me, that's my number one rule. And that's what helps me take, uh, to take the, the right decision. You know, like I go and write something, I imagine, okay, what's gonna be the worst that can happen? Okay, can I overcome it? Is there a solution? Can I hide there, there, there? Uh, oh. I cannot, okay, then I turn back and I go and do something else or I go home if I don't feel good. But, uh, but I think that's, that's the most important uh, thing. And then, of course, if you have level three, level four, level five, you, your, mar your margin goes down or up, so you, you, like you take your decisions accordingly. But it's never 100%. And that's the thing in free riding. You, you play with something that's never, never sure. Yeah. Um, uh, David tells me that I should watch Gid Lamish on YouTube. Uh, Gid Mishla, yeah, it's Tony is a very good friend of mine, and I agree what he does is uh, is very good, and and it's more specific than what I do, and, and I really recommend you to go and and check it out. Yeah. Um, how is getting COVID along uh, with you? Uh, where will you be heading to? Yeah, COVID will make the season uh, a bit special because, uh, of course, yeah, we're not going to be traveling. But to be honest, I think for, for me, it comes at the right time in my life where I'm happier in a way to ride around where I live. So uh, I'm in Verbia right now. There's so much to do around in, in the Alps, in Europe, or yeah, in North America, in Canada, wherever you are. There is always cool stuff to do. And... Uh, and, and I think the important is not necessarily to have the best, best terrain, et cetera, but it's to be with your friend and exploring. And to me, that's what, like, that's the most valuable. And, and this winter, you know, I'll just uh, take my car, go and do small missions, but uh, there won't be any, like, big trips with, like, taking a plane uh, to the, like, other, other side of the world. And to be honest, I've done that, uh, uh, like, a bit too much, and I'm tired of, traveling too much so i'm very happy to to do that yeah uh next question when do you get off the mountain after riding what's your favorite uh tipple to win down with uh does that mean well i think a beer is the best thing after <laughs> after riding <laughs> that's for sure uh and then yeah if you if, if you uh, if you want something a bit more healthy like uh, there's uh, like a lot of yoga. I love like really short yoga, 
uh, that you you know like 10 20 minutes that gives you the time to breathe a bit relax you know in front of the fire or something like this that's i think my uh my way to do it but yeah i'm not always uh <laughs> perfect so the beer is usually uh my way to go <laughs> um what are the best types of crampons to bring in the bag in case of icy spots well i think there are no uh crampons that are designed especially for snowboard boots um so so basically uh fine. i i use usually the the pets of and, and and usually what i do to make them fit to snowboard boots which have a bigger uh head like bigger um like toe box kind of on the boot so which means that they're a bit thicker on the boot i usually twist a bit the head that hold the um the sling of the crampon and that usually helps the toe get a bit better so that the feet cannot get out of the crampon and 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 that's basically what you need and that's the problem with snowboard boot that they can get off and you can lose your crampons that way and losing your crampons in the mountain is uh is basically a no-go because it can be like it's a very easy way to to kill yourself yeah uh so uh, whenever you want to buy a pair of crampons just bear that in mind. Uh, can you fit, like bring your snow boots, your, your snowboard boots? Fit like make sure you can fit the nose in them, and make sure the the, the nose will not slide away. Um, like so, um, Balas is asking like which uh, splitboard bindings to start with. Uh, I think right now. All different brands make really good uh, snowboard bindings. I ride the Rossignol plumes, uh, but yeah, like all brands are great. Honestly, like I haven't seen back system. Yeah, like like so you can have Caracom, Spark, uh, Union. Like all of them are great. And yeah, like if you feel the system, you might have different affinity with them. But uh, but basically everything works really well. You want to be but it, it's good. It's a bit of, a bit pricey to buy uh, good speedboard bindings, but uh, it's a good investment because it's a system that you're going to keep for a long time, and that's what really makes your splitboard being effective or not. Yeah. Pleasure, Damon. Um, tuck, tuck. Da, 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 da. What are the best that? Uh, like what kind of uh, split boarding shoes do you recommend uh, do crampon uh, well I think for, for me the best split board shoes well from my experience I've designed them with Deluxe so I, I will of course uh, like the Spark XV are my favorite one because they are a good mix you know with a good mountaineering sole but still which is not too stiff uh, and you have the waterproofness. You have, like, uh, you have the crampon hold. You have, like, good stiffness, which you can undo if you need to. And and they're basically the good compromise for me to, uh, uh, yeah, like to like to to having good riding down and as well being able to work to walk well on on rocks and stuff. But I think to me that's that's the most important. It's the side of being able to to have that that good soul. To being able to climb on rocks on ridges and, and be secure in that way and, and to have a boot that's like a durable comfortable warm in the mountains all the time so to me that's the number one thing uh next to the yeah like like feeling good on the on the way down because once again i prefer to suffer more on the uphill and have great riding down rather than the other way around but yeah, like i respect the other way around um like what's the difference between using snowshoes board on your back and split board is it really worth to invest in a split board yeah well i agree that split boards are expensive but it is worth um making the like the investment if you really like it because snowshoes they work but um if you try split boarding, you never go back to snowshoes. That's basically um, it. I, I, I like I told earlier, like that snowshoes can be good. Like there are specific snowshoes which are called vert in, in like really deep snow, 
like climbing up a face, but that's like super, super specific stuff, which is more in Canada or Alaska on super steep, big lines. So it's a very specific scenario. Uh, yeah, like that question comes uh, back a lot from Arno. Same question uh, between uh, like snowshoes, racket, and speedboard. For sure, speedboard is a game changer. You know, like from being able to drag your feet like this, you gain so much time. With snowshoes, you're so slow, and then you're going to have these big snowshoes in your back, uh, which is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, which do you prefer, solid board or split board? I think um, if you ride powder, like you might come to a, like almost a similar feeling with your split board. But, uh, but if you ride a slope, like if you ride really variable snow, uh, like, you know, like, snow cannons uh artificial snow stuff like this you might really feel the the edge in the middle with a split board so then a, a normal board will feel for sure much better but usually the weird thing uh, between your split board and your normal board is the fact that the bindings are different they're like more metally and and they usually have different straps and so which means that they're different from what you used to normally so that's the main difference but if you ride a lot with your speed board you end up being super used to them and not really noticing much the difference so i think the important point with uh with like bit, like preferring your normal board or your speed board is to spend a lot of time on your split board to being able to to feel good with it and you will see that you're going to be surprised that you could almost ride it all the time but it's just a bit heavy, uh, and, and like so, if you go on a yeah on a mellow day in a resort where you know you're not gonna need the speedboard at all, then the normal board is great. Yeah. Uh, thoughts on Avalanche backpack? Why are they uh, not in the mandatory safety item safety items? Well, I think anywhere you look, they usually are mentioned uh, as a mandatory item, and for me. Like whenever there is powder, I always have my uh, avalanche airbag, and it saved my life to once. And 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 yeah, it's like so often I've been like that for many years. I was like, okay, I use it, I don't, or today I don't need it. And you go up and you're at the top of the line. You're like, oh shit, what did I, what did I not take it? So I prefer having it all the time, and uh, and be happy with it. But that's uh, also a personal choice. Maybe I mentioned somewhere, I forgot to mention it somewhere, but uh, for me, it's like a, a must-have for sure all the time. Yeah. So is there a difference between the 2021 Rossignol XV with the previous year's one, apart from the graphics? No, uh, like right now, the 2021 is still the same. Uh, we changed the graphics. We haven't changed anything inside. And then next year, we have... Um, like we've been changing quite a few things on it. So we've been working on it. I'm going to test it now in the next few days. And uh, yeah, I'm quite happy about the evolution. So so yeah, keep it up. It will come in a years from now, but, um, but it should be good. But yeah, the XV is a classic model. So I think it doesn't need to change much. Like technology and snowboards haven't changed that much. So... So I think, um, yeah, it's a classic which will stay there and and still stay the way it is. Yeah. So in Japan, deep powder would splitboard work okay or use verts also for heavy bag uh, canister battery ones. So for Japan, uh, the snow it's it's a bit like in Alaska. It's very maritime, so for, like with a lot of humidity in it, and splitboard work amazing. Uh, pff, snowshoes, yeah, it's it's the same thing. It's you know, it's not like because there's a lot of like in Japan, you can have two meters of snow, but because it's maritime, so loaded with humidity, you don't sink in like you would in Europe, and that's uh, that's something kind of weird if you're not used to um, to the feeling of it. Uh, like basically, you're gonna jump a big jump like in two meters of snow, and you're not gonna go that far down. And I find actually, I find actually harder to stomp big cliffs uh, in those kind of snow, Alaska or Japan. Uh, because yeah, it's more firm and it doesn't make you sink in it. So yeah, in, in a way, it gives you more flotation for speedboarding. Uh, and for canister or uh, or um, or or fan, like the one uh, like for the heavy bags, do they uh, like? Do I prefer the ones with canister or with um, uh, sorry, or, or with a uh, 
gas bottle or with a fan, so which means uh, which means a battery. I would say that I've never ridden uh, one with a battery. It, it feels a bit scary, but I guess it's been a testing model, so so why not? But I'm um, honestly I'm I love the old ABS system, which is like kind of minimal, simple with a light uh, carbon battery. Doesn't weigh much, and I know it works because I've been using it for. Uh, over 10 years now and you know like some bags i've been keeping storing really badly and, and you can just take your bag and it works no matter what and for me that's number one but people you know that use the battery ones can be very happy about it but yeah once again it's a preference yeah um ta -ta 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 -ta. which items are underrated when going uh on a day backcountry tour hmm that's a good question uh, I would say uh, that's that, like I would say a communication device so like whenever you're you're touring I think what's super important is to being able to like call for an alert and well actually no that's not the most important but yeah but that's something that maybe you would not think of when you go and prepare your adventure you would not think okay am i going to be like am, am i going to have cell reception where i go because we're kind of used to be having it all the time and then when something happens in a place where you don't and you're on your own or just with your body and your body's under it can be uh, really bad not to have good communication so so that's when you need to start thinking of radios or emergency devices or things like this so i think to me that would be the like the one thing um tac 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 uh do you ever suggest to go solo or a partner is always required or recommended uh, well yeah like honestly normally i would really not i really don't recommend going on your own because uh yeah in the mountains there are so many ways to get stuck like even uh, somewhere super easy on a very mellow day you break your ankle uh it's the afternoon <laughs> you're on your own it's super easy terrain you can't get out what do you do <laughs> uh, you make yourself a hole get in there uh, and spend the night because you're not going to be able to uh like yeah to 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 go home so so i think that's super important to always think that yeah it doesn't take much to basically block yourself and, and not being able to come home so if you don't have someone else with you to help you to to go and and claim for for an alert like to call for the rescue and things like this you know it makes a uh it could quickly escalate to a very like a minor incident could like suddenly become very very big so go go with someone <laughs> um Sorry, uh, ta, ta, ta. what do you think about keeping trekking poles on backpack while riding down? Uh, well, I think for uh, yeah, for the trekking poles, like I think poles make a massive difference in, in your effort. So I, I try to use them all the time, uh, like yeah, and in summer as well, like because you you basically you're so much more efficient when you have poles. Uh, and you save a lot of energy on your legs. Like it's a lot more spread out the energy you spend. And basically, uh, I think I recommend three uh, three part uh, uh, poles, like because they fold in 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 a quite small uh, piece, and they can go into your backpack. So I think that's much better than when you have them outside your backpack and they stick out. and And if you fall, you can hurt yourself with them. And also, like having things that are hanging on your backpack always ends up dangling and things like this. So if you can. Uh, if you want to invest one day in good poles, just get three pieces uh, touring poles and uh, you're going to love them because then you can have them in the backpack all the time and, uh, and you will see that you use them more and more and you become a lot more efficient to move around and, and to follow skiers, for example. So, so yeah. So that's uh, my answer to that. Yeah. A uh, question from Willem. Uh, how do you build a personal alpine anchor? Um, with what material and what two-piece design do you use? 
Um, so for s snow anchor, basically, technically, you need a like you need a little. It depends on the snow. Basically, if you have a really sticky snow, uh, which will you know bond quickly, you can do uh, a snow anchor with a sock basically like you know it's it's that strong of course if it's if I, you're not going to do it unless uh, you have nothing else but you always have something else like uh, an ice axe a piece of wood uh, someone else's key uh, it, well if they if they're not coming with you uh, but basically you can use a lot of things and and it will depend on um, on on the snow quality that's the the first thing uh, and, and basically it's good when you do it to make sure you respect a way like well the the procedure of doing it like you really need to do a t and to have a good alignment with the with the sling so that it doesn't pull upwards all your system uh but like watch some tutorials about it uh because i think uh it's great to know how to do a snow anchor because it can save you quite a lot uh like if you're in trouble or if you have to help someone uh, getting uh, through through some cliffs or going up something, so that's uh, that's something that's always good to know. And, and of course, if you go on glaciers, uh, like for being able to to rescue someone or secure someone that has fallen in a, into a crevasse, that's uh, very helpful to know how to do it. Uh, question from uh, David Hages or Saucisson. <laughs> Saucisson, yeah. No, no, from the Pyrenees where I come from, it's uh, saucisson is a uh, is kind of a religion, and <laughs> and uh, I I live by it. I'm actually dependent. I need to go on rehab for stopping it because uh, because I love it too much. <laughs> um, so, a question from Chris, uh, uh, like a tip for board for uh, riding in the forest. Um, like a big board that floats a lot uh, and, and rides mellow, or a small one that's agile, but uh, but which will make you like force you to ride faster. Actually, I think yeah, I really I will really recommend the, the smaller uh, fishy kind of type of board. So uh, yeah, like they're usually around one fifty five to to one sixty. I think that's the size that I take, and they usually have like. Um, a big pin tail, so which means a really much wider nose compared to the tail. So it allows you to ride with both your feet on it. You don't have to be really on, on your back foot to try to get your nose out. And they're super fun because they're super playful. And uh, I really recommend like everyone to ride forest as much as possible and as fast as possible because uh, into the forest, you develop so much your reflexes on how to play with your board and with your feet. And to me, it's always been kind of early season to get ready. Like, if, like I would get to the lift uh, here in Verbia and, and I would go up and down like as fast as I could through the woods, like several times in a row, and then go to the park. And then you do that for a few days. And then anything you ride after that feels so easy. Yeah. So, um, like, keep it in mind. And Tatak... Uh, is there a sweet spot in terms of st steepness you love to ride? How do you find lines of this gradient? Um, I, that's a good condition. Like, uh, that's a good question uh, from Emily. Basically, I think uh, steep terrain gives a, a lot nicer feeling uh, you know, when you ride POW because like, you don't have to jump as much when you do your turns. It's just like really flawless. You just let yourself... Uh, carry through but of course it will depend on the on the snow quality because hard snow with a uh, like 40 degrees can be like more scary than a 60 degree with really good powder and, and same also on really steep terrain the like avalanche conditions are going to be easier to control because you're going to have less accumulation of snow so if it goes it will only go in small pockets it will rarely go uh, with a whole run and so that's going to be easier to find like the safe spots and, and the islands of safety and, and read all the, the pockets of snow. So, um, so yeah, I think, I don't know, my sweet spot, maybe 45, 50 with uh, 30, meet, uh, 30 centimeters of fairly dense powder. I think that's my uh, favorite. <laughs> 
yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, technical writing, is there anything you'd like to improve? Uh, loading and deflecting in the turns, foot pedaling in less uh, grippy terrain. Well, I'm not sure I understand everything. But uh, I think that, so in technical writing, so which means in steep writing, I guess, for me, uh, one important point um, which will make a really big difference and which requires to train for it and to force yourself to do is to really not be on your back foot because when it's steep, reflex is to being always on your back, like kind of on your back seat, back foot. And it puts you in a really bad position and, and it takes away the grip from your feet and your board. And, and, and if you're able to be a bit more upright, so on, onto your front foot, when you make a turn, you commit to it, you go into it, that will make a big, big uh, difference. It will make your turns easier. It will make you, uh, it will give a lot more grip to your board if you need to have some. Uh, and, and it will make you a lot more safe. But uh, it's a psychological game, basically, where you need to, like, like, basically get used to it, like get used to always be kind of riding in a committed, like controlled speed, but committed way in terms of position, which means really on both your feet, really standing upright. So think about it as, a, yeah, like your upper body is vertical, and then uh, the rest happens underneath on its own. And as soon as your upper body is not vertical, like like leaning against the slope, you will see that you lose your grip. It's hard to turn, and you will quickly realize the difference. So train on this. It's um, it's going to make you a much better steep rider. Um, tac tac. Am I going to ski tomorrow? Yeah, I might go in the afternoon, especially if it keeps on snowing a little bit. I'm sorry for those that are not able to to ride because it's not allowed or because you're not in the in the place. But yeah, like here, it's uh, starting to be game on. So yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gonna enjoy and and I'll do a like a bit of a, a turn for whoever cannot. Yeah. Um, question from Wolf: Any advice on how to scope with different track width in the uphill? If you are uh, out exploring together with ski tourists, or there are old tracks around, uh, ah, okay, yeah, yeah, it's true that uh, like when you uh, when you, when you split board, like you usually need like your like your skis, so, so your half boards are wider than skis, so it's always a bit of a nightmare depending on the snow quality to follow tracks from skiers. So. Of course, if you go with other split borders and you make your own tracks and you follow each other tracks, you know, it works a lot better. And also, usually with split boards, we have a bit more spread out feet. But, uh, but I guess that's, that's something that get, you get used to. And, uh, and if you go with skiers, maybe you could ask your friends when they're in front to, um, uh, like to widen a bit their, their feet so that it works better with your wider skis. Uh, and that, that you know like if you're a skier and, and you're bringing snowboarder friends like maybe do that also maybe i think that's one episode i would like to do it's to kind of tell skiers what to do to make uh snowboarders comfortable like you know to for example to always think when they're stopping somewhere to stop somewhere like where it's not just flat behind so that you can have a bit of speed for the snowboarder to go through or, uh, you know, to help pulling your friends when necessary or to put the traverses in the right way. Uh, I think, that, well, there are so many things to be said about that and which make a big difference and which could uh, also make skiers and snowboarders even more uh, happy to ride together because uh, I think that's important. I think that all war is not uh, really, uh, um, yeah, like worthwhile anymore. <laughs> Uh, do you wear a back protector or any kind of protectors uh, besides your helmet? Uh, no, I think I consider uh, like that the backpack really does well the trick for protecting the back. Okay, of course, a back protector is better. Uh, but when you start walking around in the mountains, you have all your touring gear, you have everything. 
it's a bit of a double usage and it makes you sweat a lot. So yeah, no, I don't write it uh, with it much. And I, yeah, you could also same with shorts, protection shorts. Uh, they can be good if you ride park, but as soon as you start walking around in the mountains, touring and things, the yeah, sweat, sweaty and and yeah, they're not comfortable. So no, I don't. But I'm 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 old school. <laughs> uh, if you would have only one board, which one would you use? I think I would use the XV63. I think because that's the board. Uh, uh, that's my like that's the board I use most of the time, and I could ride this one all the time. I would be happy in every single conditions really, because it works. Yeah, like perfectly well on super heavy metal lines on forest tree, like fast, playful riding. I ride the park as well with it. I, you can carve. So I think to me, that's my uh, number one board. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I'm not the kind of guy that likes to change boards too much. So I usually like I would say 90 percent of the days I ride this board. Yeah. And sometimes if I go on really big lines, I'll go a bit of a bigger size because it makes a really big like those like i go to 67 because four centimeters make a crazy difference in terms of your speed of riding and the way you know like you can stump uh turns and uh, stump cliffs and stuff but uh on any kind of day for myself it's the 163 yeah so how dangerous is uh riding in the forest is there less avalanche risk um yeah like in the forest, there is less avalanche risk, but if there is any avalanche, it will crush you onto a tree. So you win some, you lose some, if you see what I mean. So that's uh, one part of the danger. But then another part of the danger is to, you know, like hitting a tree or getting stuck into a tree well or, or something like this and being on your own because it's a lot harder to find you if you're in the woods somewhere. Uh, than if you're in the mountains in a in a place where it's visible and where people will pass through, so I think that's something to to bear in mind when you ride in the forest. Uh, like you know, like make your own track, but always kind of try to keep uh, like connection with a like your riding buddy, like being not too far away because that's uh, that's quite a big danger. Um, mm -mm. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Will Victor participate in World Tour in 2021? Yes, he will. Yeah, he broke his um his um shoulder like uh, not too long ago, uh, maybe three weeks ago, I would say, three four weeks ago. And uh, yeah, he's recovering now. But I guess by the end of the month, he should be fine, and he should be ready for um, for first stop. So it's a bit of a shame because he was like starting to train and stuff and, and being really stuck, but. That's what happens, yeah. Um, like, so question from uh, Scott Snow, like from Scotland. Uh, is COVID is restricting everyone's plans at the moment, but do you have any film movie projects in the pipeline for us to look forward to? Well, I'm kind of um, thinking of a project which will kind of, um, where I want to use paraglides to access lines and do things like this. Uh, so. Um, I'm going to start working on it early winter. And then if it's uh, good enough and if it gives good enough results, I might uh, do a, a full film about it. So I'm actually really excited because I've been really enjoying uh, fr flying paraglides uh, lately. Like, you know, those really uh, tiny, like um, super light wings. And, and, and yeah, you could have some setups that are like kind of a kilo with everything included. So that's pretty crazy. And uh, <coughs> and I think, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, yeah, I'm really excited about mixing like different sports together and especially all the mountaineering sports with paragliding. I think that's always such a fun um, setup. Like, yeah, so so I think that's, uh, that's something that I'm going to be working on. And I saw earlier there was a question about uh, do you ever snow kite? So I did a few sessions of snow kiting and it works amazingly well. But uh, but you need to be really in a specific spot where there is really consistent wind. And that's not something that's uh, always easy. So uh, I, I tried in Col du Lotare next to La Grave, which is the mecca for it. And it, like 
it was crazy. Like in 10, 15 minutes, we would climb a thousand meters. It was just that easy. It was mental. So that's something I want to, to play with more because uh, it's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, so will you make more episodes of the sustainability dialogue? Uh, I'm not sure, basically, because we did uh, like we did all these episodes for um, uh, basically because we're doing a film about uh, like going traveling to the poles with Johan Rockstrom, and the film got canceled. So we decided to use all the stuff that we had been shooting with Johan because he's such an inspiring person, um, and and he's basically changed my mind on on like you know, like my approach to sustainability and being able also to talk about it and um, yeah. And to understanding what happens and what are the challenges and things. So yeah, he comes to Verbia regularly and, and like every time we go free riding together. So, so yeah, why not? I think. And if you have any specific like questions about it, uh, I would be happy to, to like, talk about that with him and let him like uh, talk the talk because he does that so well and he's so like it's really uh, passionating to uh, to listen to him yeah uh, tac 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 so Jones versus Rossignol <laughs> conflict of interest there <laughs> no well I think uh, yeah I'm very happy about like about my uh, all my Rossignol collection between the sushi the sashimi uh, like uh, the XV and everything, and now the the after hours from from Marion. But uh, I would say that Jeremy is doing an amazing John jo job with Jones, and like all his snowboards are really good. And um, and I think he's been really pushing the whole like split boarding and, and like the whole free riding thing in such a like way that I have um, yeah I'm really uh, thankful to all his job and really respectful to what he's done. And um, yeah. He's got great passion for snowboarding, so long live Johns and and, and Rossignol as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, quick question about uh, environment and CO two. What do you think of the use of helicopter for the backcountry? Well, yeah, it's a good question because, uh, like, for making films, uh, like. Yeah, like especially action films, like helicopters, they they change the game completely. So for sure, I've uh, I, I've been using them for many years, and and personally, I hate them because they bring so much stress. There's so much noise. It's so expensive. Everybody's so stressed, and you're in the nature. You feel a bit like a cock, but but at the same time, they're they're like they're very practical. So so I. Don't say I will never ever do helicopters, but if I had the choice, I don't use them. Uh, and also, like if you like, if you ask me what's my dream day with friends, take a helicopter and go riding something, or go touring and do something, I will hundred percent choose the touring because uh, yeah, you have no stress, you're on your own schedule, you you have no no noise, no no pressure, nothing. You feel the mountains in its really in, in its real way, and, and that's like really valuable. And in terms of environmental and CO two, I think the heli is not really a big CO two uh, emission factor because we calculated one year, uh, like so we did. I think what, what like the biggest season we did, we did like fifteen days of heli, so which is a lot. Uh, so that was like fifteen years ago, and. and uh, uh, we calculated with the pilot uh, the amount of fuel that we spent was the same as one person going to New York one way. So it was really uh, like I was really surprised about the results. So it's really not much in terms of uh, CO2. But to me, the real pollution is the noise because the noise uh, of a heli, if you hear it from so far away and you have when you're on a nice touring day and you hear, hear helis around, it's, uh, it's a bit frustrating. So, so yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not completely um, <coughs> against them, but yeah, yeah. It's a it's a fun experience. Of course, if you've never done it and you will go helling, it's like amazing. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> so, a question from Basil: uh, Do you still use the Hexo Plus? Uh, for, no, I have stopped using them for a long time because. Uh, like so the company squadron stopped uh, kind of doing it 
uh, as a Fallout drone because it was just too hard to compete with a uh, DJI basically. Uh, so D like DJI is what I've been using. Like so, the small Mavic because it's like really compact. You can have it in your backpack. And it's super safe, super easy to use. So uh, and a, and a really good like image quality. So so yeah, I think um, like the Chinese they know what they're doing with their drones and um, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, luckily Squadron has gone to so the company that was doing Hexo, which I've been a part of, uh, like so now they they're doing in just industrial solutions like so for safety and things like this. So which is a lot more uh, a lot easier to handle than big mass production for uh, millions of drones like uh, the plan was to be and like TGI and the Chinese do. Yeah. Um. So. Oh, he's asking like if I could put the like open source code uh, in open. I could I could ask uh, the guys because honestly I have been uh, really disconnected from it. But um, uh, I could ask it, and maybe next time I can tell you more about that. Yeah. Cool, cool. Hey, um, I don't know what you guys think, but um, I think uh, <laughs> it's beer clock. Uh, I see a question here about rituals before uh, before dropping it. <laughs> My ritual now is to go and uh, <laughs> and have a nice beer. <laughs> and uh, I hope you guys can have one too. Maybe not if you're in the US or or in Canada, because <laughs> it's probably a bit early. But who knows? Um, but hey, guys, thank you so much for asking all your questions. So I'll be doing this every two weeks. And I'm gonna be, yeah, doing sometimes some some in French, um, yeah, because I have, yeah, like from being French, a lot of French followers, and um, yeah, thank you guys. Feel free to prepare like some questions, and uh, and uh, you could even send some questions just a bit before uh, before end on the how to XV page, and that way I can you know be a bit more specific about the topic. And then also throughout the season, I'm going to get more uh, specific about certain topics sometimes, like give a theme to to the, the thing. So thank you very much. It's like uh, really nice to see all of you guys. And um, yeah, if you're not writing yet, like have good patience. So I hope you're going to be writing soon. And if you're writing now, enjoy. And um, yeah, thank you very much. May the force be with you.